hello hello back with the streams with <laughs> after like i think what three months since our last stream uh those of you who have been with us before you might notice the channel's looking a bit different uh new setup new channel name uh we've got new profile picture new everything um and i guess what we've decided to do is actually um take the channel the youtube channel in a bit of a different direction um going forward so we're planning to um, take all the cool 3D printing automation stuff that we've got going on at 3DQ and actually um, using it to do pretty much stress testing of a whole bunch of new um, and old 3D printing products and um, use, use the automation to basically prove like what 3D printer products work really well um, under extreme workloads. So for example, Today, we'll be looking at putting the, the dyes hot end, which is a very high end hot end on the Ender 3, which is a very low end printer. Um, and doing a bit of an, ex we'll be setting up an experiment um, to do a thousand hours of printing on a single Ender with the dyes hot end and see what kind of issues uh, we run into, if we run in, into any issues at all. Um, and the point of this kind of experiment is really just to um, determine what components are best for reliability. So. At 3DQ, like we 3D print pretty much most of the parts that go out in our Quinley kits. And so uptime and reliability of components is really important. Um, and our entire print farm, which consists of 51 Ender 3s, um, now that we've had it you know, over a year, we've learned a ton about kind of what, what components break down, what needs to be replaced. This is actually one of the printers from the, the farm and you can see it's it's not a stock ender it's mostly stock but we have replaced some of the uh quick to fail components like the hot end is an e3 db6 and then we've also put auto leveling on it so the point of this new channel is um basically showing off some of the experiments uh, we do here internally because i think well we think you guys would find it interesting too and um, i mean if we find a hot end combo that can run reliably for a thousand hours and it'd probably be uh, interesting for you to know uh, so that you don't have to spend so much time, uh, you know, unclogging poorly built hot ends. That's kind of where we're going with the channel. Uh, we'll be doing weekly streams and then we'll be setting up the tests on the streams. And then, um, so a thousand hours is like 42 days, I think. Um, and so after that, we'll also be publishing a video on the results and probably talking about the results on the stream as well. This will pretty much be a complete build guide on putting a dies extruder on an under three, which is a bit ridiculous. It actually had, we found out it's been done once before and they had really mixed results. So I'm kind of excited to see um, what happens with it. And who knows, like if we can run this thing without getting any jams or clogs and maybe it does make the uh, $330 price tag well worth it. So I'm just trying to get the our, our cooling fan out of here. Um, so I've got the hot end and everything unmounted from the uh, Ender's X carriage now. We can talk about future video ideas. Next week, we'll just be doing just, I mean, we'll be we'll be doing an automation upgrade for um, an Ender Pro for one of our new interns. Uh, but some of the other video ideas we've had is like running, you know, crazy amounts of really abrasive filament and trying to come up with a strategy for being able to print it over long periods of time without completely destroying your hardware. So I've got the hot end all detached. Fun stuff. We've got some uh, questions. Uh, any breaking new uh, news yet on the new product? On what new product? <laughs> I'm just guys looking for are you any updates for your time later? Yeah. Uh, which product specifically though? There are a bunch of things coming out, I should say. Um, and there's a lot of news scheduled for the month of May um, on a couple different products, uh, including the Quinley software, and then some announcements uh, for certain things that are in production testing and beta testing and um, going out to some reviewers as well. So there's a lot of potential news he could be asking about. Okay, I don't think there's any other wiring we have to do. I'm just going to snip this. Okay, so we've got to mount it to Steven's 3D printed mount that Steven's designed. Here we go. 
that for now. Just layer glossiness. This is a very, very thick extrusion. It's my method. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone's got a 3D printing style. That's fine. Honestly, it kind of reminds me of the little like piano lid. Is that what it's the same shape. Maybe that'll be the name. The piano. The piano. Grand piano bags. Fender shape. Just gonna wrap the old extruder, uh, or remove the old extruder cable and then wrap a new one. Good question. What size nozzle is it? I think it's a zero point four. Yeah, it's zero point four. Um, it's kind of impressive how they made it. Um, I think there are actually two layers of material to it. So when we are doing the flow test, we have to also consider in the results that these are flow tests through a 0.4 millimeter nozzle and not, you know, through a one millimeter nozzle or something massive like that. But I think that's actually going to be a bit better uh, in terms of being able to kind of convey the results because most people are used to their, you know, their 0.4 millimeter print head. So you'll be able to see like what kind of speeds and, and flow rate we get relative to um, a standard setup. Right. So I'll wrap the extruder, new extruder cable. Okay, looking good so far. Yeah, let me throw this on now. I'm just going to take the dies cable and shove it through the back here. You can't see. But you should be able to see uh, once I've done that. You got some questions about uh, nozzle size. What do you think? What's your favorite nozzle size? Um, well, everyone starts with 0.4. And then once we start doing production, we started using 0.8 quite a lot, which I like because it makes things print fast. And you can actually get really nice um, top surface finish with 0.8. But recently on my printer at home, I've been using a 0.6. And what's been cool about that one is um, a 0.6 let you pretty easily get 0.8 line width um, but then you can reduce the line width as well where, where it needs to be reduced because one of the limitations with 0.8 is um, if your model has thinner walls than 0.8 uh, it won't print them well so i would say 0.6 right now given that this i don't know if you can see this is not a locking connector um, for the testing i'm going to keep this lid open just in case we have to either swap it around um, and then, or if the connection is bad. And then once we find the right configuration, what I'll do is just glue it down. I got it. Yep. I understand. See, this is what? <laughs> Quite simple, really. Yeah, there's just no, more sound relief. Yeah. The piano mount. Yeah. Close up, just screw it in. There we go. Yep, that's what the people want to see. <laughs> I would say this is actually the climax of the entire stream. Very nice. The uh, screwing it into this one millimeter extrusion width part. How long did it take you to print this? It's such a wide extrusion. Just, just over an hour. Really? Yeah. That's not that bad. That's the thing too. Like this surface is not visible, so you can go so thick and not have to worry about it. Like that's one of the things I think people overlook with three D printing. Like. There's also the really handy feature in Cura where you can skip every second or third layer for infill, right? Because yeah. no one's going to see inside this part, especially if it's not like a... Yeah, just saving time. So also, if you uh, certain layer heights are thicker on the inside than on the outside, or for support. Right. I think you can even do in Cura, you have the ability to... Um, your inner perimeters can be higher layer widths. Than your outer ones. And then we'll just throw this in here. Oh, it's it's going up by itself. Look at that. Well, we hit the weight threshold for our Z. Yeah, see. See, that's how you align the these screws up the way. Just shove it to the bottom and then. So actually, the Prusa method is to take a zip tie and shove the flat end under the uh, the probe. And that generally, generally gives you actually a good offset. Um, in some cases, it doesn't. But if you if you're running a decent probe, it actually is quite. Um, when moving the 
nozzle around, it's important to keep the paper underneath it in case the ramp causes the offset to, like, if, if the bed is ramped um, and your nozzle starts digging into the bed, the paper will kind of give you fair warning before that happens. Yeah, to prevent scratching the bed. There's a lot of time spent uh, calibrating because uh, in order for the printer to run a thousand hours, you want to make sure it runs well for those thousand hours. Quite a bit of time uh, up front to make sure everything is good to go, and then you pretty much don't have to worry about the printer after that. I'm just looking at some of the settings. So I've got the 0.4 layer height, which is crazy on a 0.4 nozzle, 0.8 line width. Again, we're just pushing for flow rate. In the interest of time, I'm going to do these gradual info steps, so you'll see it actually. Uh, this is a very, very useful feature for cutting down print times. Um, it'll start, so if I set it to 2, the end infill is 60%, but it cuts down half to 30 here, and then to 15 for the majority of the print. So your top layers are supported really well. Um, and the bottom of the print, if obviously if strength is not required, uh, you can just drop down your info all the way to 15%. But it keeps your top layers really nice. It's almost like an internal version of support, um, and it saves so much time. I'm going to set these temperatures a bit hotter just because we're pushing so much filament. So I'm going to do 220, uh, 223. Build plate needs to be at 60 for the vapor uh, automation bed. Initial layer, we probably want to keep fairly low just for adhesion purposes i cannot think of anything else we would change we're just trying to push speed and flow rate right through this 0.4 nozzle so this calibration cube should take 11 minutes to print I'm surprised by how little ringing there is, considering how much heavier this is. Oh yeah, we should do um, a ringing test, because we can print like fast, linearly, and then just have the layer height be 0.1. Yeah. There's actually a little bit of uh, two gaps. Yeah, there are a couple gaps. And then the bottom layer too is... Yeah, I think this is something we'll have to investigate further when we do the results video. We've got one sample cube. We've confirmed that the hot end works with the Ender 3. Yeah, so next week, so this this will pack away um, and start the 1,000 hour test. Um, we're going to do some more calibration to see just how much filament we can push through this. We have confirmed that we can get good results and that it works on an Ender 3. Um, but then we're going to go and see yeah, just how much filament we can push through this because it should be able to handle quite a high flow rate. Um, and the next week, we'll be doing another stream um, where we'll be installing a Twinly kit on an Ender 3 Pro. And this will be kind of like an update to our um, stream from, I think, back in January, where we were doing kind of a, an assembly or a build along stream. Um, yeah, just to give people a sense of kind of what's changed with the kit, what the kit looks like now. Um, and of course, talking about automation and uh, yeah, just refreshing the video. As always, if you want to kind of keep up to date with the many experiments we're planning on running with the automated printing system and, you know, different hot ends, different filaments, um, definitely subscribe to this YouTube channel since we'll be hosting those videos here. And in the meantime, if you want to keep connected, we also do have a Discord. So if you want to chat with us over there, if you're impatient to hear the results for the video too, those will be kind of shared there as we collect them. Of course, if you want to pick up a Quinley kit for yourself uh, for automated 3D printing, you can just go to shop.3d2.com. You can also watch the 1,000-hour print test. We'll be running that on our Twitch 24-7 um, at twitch.tv slash 3D loop. We'll be putting up the 24-7 uh, the live stream there. So I encourage you to follow that and check, check along every couple hundred hours to see how the dyes extruder is, is performing. Um, yeah, other than that, I'll see you guys next week.
with the Ender Pro automation upgrade. 